today, I'm going to share with you my journey in how I found my bloom in a world that grows garbage. Trendy is not only about reducing food waste, but is it about creating an equal food system where everyone has accessibility and affordability to food, not only to those that can afford it. And my story starts on a cold January day in winter of 2016, where I was sitting in my office placing a produce order for my juice and smoothie bar. I was thinking to myself, how am I going to make this juice for less? The price of fruits and vegetables was fluctuating on a daily basis, making it too expensive to produce certain juices. And if I didn't find a solution soon, my business was going to bust. A couple months later, I was introduced to the fairy godmother of food, Christine Cuvelier. She is a food trendologist. She looks at the future of food, and she identifies what we'll eat in the future, when we'll eat it, and where we'll eat it. And she said to me, Krissa, what if you started making your juice with ugly fruits and vegetables instead of perfect ones that you find in the grocery store? And I said, huh, a little light bulb went off. That's a great idea. So, I ran with this idea Christine presented to me, and within one year, and this is only one juice bar, we were able to save 40,000 kilos of misfit fruits and vegetables. If we were to stockpile that on this stage today, it would take up this whole stage and it would run 10 boxes high, minimum. And on top of it, we were able to reduce our costs by 40% and then take that savings and pass it on to the customer. It was a win, win, win situation. This, my friends, is called upcycling. Taking some, something no one wants, rescuing it, and creating something of value. I was enamored with upcycling. I wasn't sure where I was going with it past the juice bar, but I wanted to explore it. Unfortunately, the juice world was not 100% for me. As a creative marketer, I was stuck in a very operational position, ordering lots of produce all the time and managing operational schedules. And I liked the experience of learning something new, but I, it wasn't true to my roots. And so after a year and a bit of the juice bar world, I left to go work into uh, agencies. And I worked in marketing agencies, managing 10 plus brands, anything from cannabis to food to consumer goods. And it was fun, you know, you had a fun, busy social life. And the issue though was I was working 16 hour days, often six days per week. And I was on my screen, whether that was my phone or my computer for 12 plus hours per day. And often when things got very stressful, I would not eat or sleep or drink for two to three days on end sometimes, simply due to the amount of stress and workload I had. And of course, I had little projects on the side too, so I created this for myself. It was unhealthy. But one day, my brain had enough, and it broke. I don't remember much from that day, but what I can tell you, and what my father tells me, is that he pulled me out of the middle of a street, 
trying to get cars to stop to take me downtown to a meeting. A meeting that did not exist. The next morning, I woke up in the hospital. I hadn't seen this kind of hospital before. It's not the traditional style. It was super fancy. And I was in Vancouver, but I was like, God, got up, out of bed. I'm like, my arms don't hurt. My legs are fine. I can see. I don't feel any pain. Why am I here? So I got, you know, walked over to the door. And when I got to that door, I went to open it. And it kept not opening. And I'm thinking to myself, what is going on? A couple minutes later, the doctor comes in. He says, Krista, you have been diagnosed with bipolar and you had a manic episode and you're gonna have to take a year off work to get better. Your brain is, is not in a great place. And he said it was gonna be tough, but I didn't expect six months of hell. It was the most frustrating experience. And so I sat for six months in my bedroom staring at a wall because Netflix was simply too stimulating. And the only thing my brain wanted to do was yoga or walking. That's all it could take. It was hard though. I had to fight every day to do one of those things. Also, no one tells you about how psych meds affect your brain and your body, right? They're very challenging and you have to go through a whole process of testing and trying and adjusting. <sighs> However, as challenging as that experience was, my mental health does not define me. It has taught me compassion, resilience, and that I had to find a better way of doing things. It was a second chance on a silver platter. And so, in 2018, September to be exact, this is about six months later, I was coming back from Italy with my mother. She thought that it would be great to take me out of my environment and get me somewhere else in the sun and different culture. And when I came home from that trip, I was introduced to my future partner. Craig McIntosh. And Craig was a global food strategist. He loved food. He was so passionate about it. And we had so many similarities in terms of things we wanted to do. And so as we got to know each other, we went for a walk along the seawall one day. And he turns to me and says, did you know, Krista, that there's 1.2 billion tons of edible food waste on this planet and the 800 million people every year are hungry for every day of that year. And I turned around to him and I said, what? You understand food waste and upcycling too? <laughs> <sighs> that was it. Trendy was born that day. And so we started our adventure. It was interesting because the adventure didn't start with our food waste solutions. It started with a project called the Smoothie Machine. The Smoothie Machine is a fully automated smoothie bar. The idea of it is to help make healthy food more accessible and affordable to everyone. Traditionally, we pay about $9 here in Vancouver for a smoothie. Out of that smoothie is $6 because it is a reduction of 90% labor compared to a traditional smoothie bar. And so this idea of automating and reducing costs was really interesting. The challenge was, Craig and I launched this project at the Canadian Health Food Association trade show uh, in February of 2020. <laughs> And all of our contracts and our smoothie dreams were crushed. 
So we took a deep breath and we got back to the drawing board and we hit the seawall again, this time with a joint in hand because we needed a little extra creativity to, and something to soften the mood. And so we did exactly that. We, we walked the seawall and about two hours in, Craig turns to me and says, Krista, I figured it out. <laughs> okay, Craig, what is it? What if we took the idea of the smoothie machine and instead of automating smoothies, we automated the capture and the reduction of food waste. And we could go to the farms and we could process otherwise wasted materials. And I said, that's an idea. That's kind of cool. But, you know, what's it called? How will it work? You know, what are we going to need to do this? And he says to me, this will be called Biotrim. And Biotrim will be built in upcycled shipping containers. And inside those shipping containers, we'll have automated food processing equipment to take, let's, for example, all ugly carrots and process them into a shelf-stable powder using dryers. So now this food that was going to go wasted is now shelf-stable and can be distributed. Because food production is not the issue in this world. It is food distribution. And we are always trying to play this cat and mouse game of getting fresh food all the way through the life chain or the life cycle. So what would it look like if Biotrim went to a farm? Well, these would be the ugly misfit carrots <laughs> and we would turn them into those awesome flakes. This idea was getting more and more exciting, but I'm going to tell you a little story of why those carrots on those farms are there. Because the grocery store doesn't think you, as consumers, will buy them. So they tell the farmers, if you have ugly fru f fruits or vegetables in your harvest, don't give them to us, because we don't want them. Our people won't buy them. But they don't give a, anybody a choice. They just say it. And so we wanted to help the farmers, because the farmers are the ones who take the most risk in the food cycle, and they get squeezed most by the large corporates. We wanted to give them another option to generate revenue and save those delicious misfit carrots. The second group we wanted to help was, of course, the marginalized, the, the hungry 800 million people hungry in this world. And so we would take those flakes and we would mix them and blend them and turn them into powders so we could create emergency food, food that you would typically see in space. And that was the goal. We wanted to help the farmers and we wanted to help marginalized communities in this equation. Yes, we profit as a business, but it was so important to us that our foundation was built on that. Now, that this project was getting its legs and we understood where we were going, there was one big question we had to ask. Where are we getting the money? These fancy food trucks cost over one and a half million dollars to create, and Craig and I, since our smoothie dreams had been crushed, were living in an empty apartment on a mattress, living off a dollar seventy-five a day food budget. And so, we started figuring out how we could talk, connect with them. And we quickly realized we needed to talk to accelerators because accelerators teach you how to speak to investors, communicate with them, and pitch to them. The only issue was that Craig and I would have to invest $8,000 to take part in this accelerator program. Turns out that we only had $10,000 in the bank account. So we looked at each other and we said, are we going to go all in or not? And we did. We put all our chips in at the chance of maybe getting an investor for this project. This was January of this year. <laughs> By February, Craig and I had found an investor with an amazing heart and tons of experience in the tech and the, f and the finance space. And he wanted to help us 
bring our disruptive project to life. He didn't want to just give us the money, he wanted to guide us in that direction. And by March, we were named semi-finalists in the Government of Canada's Food Waste Reduction Challenge. And they also threw us some cash on the side too, which helped us a little more. By June, we had raised all the money we needed for our project. Trendy was officially getting its wings. The, the challenge was there was only two of us still. And we had all this money, but we had no team. So we got to the drawing board. And we wanted to build an environment that was inclusive, diverse, and flexible. And inclusive of special brains like mine, where they would not only work, but excel. And that's exactly what we did. Trendy scaled from two people to 80 in six months. And every day, our team wears their invisible capes and fights and uses their, their superpowers to fight for a mission much greater than all of us. I often wonder to myself where this idea of Trendy started. Where was the seed of Trendy planted? And it was planted in my grandparents' kitchen. My grandparents were immigrants from Europe, and they grew up during the wartime. There was nothing to waste back then, and the little that you had, you never wasted. This is a photo that re represents a childhood memory of when my grandparents would harvest their tomatoes in their backyard every August, and we would pile them all into the kitchen, turn them into sauce, and never one tomato left behind. If you're as embarrassed as I am about Canada wasting the most food in the world per capita, then I encourage you to take the pledge to stop food waste. I did, and I found my bloom in a world that grows garbage. Reducing food waste is trendy, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.